I am Shannon Weber with the Bay Area Perinatal AIDS Center, and I'm here with Dr. Judy Auerbach. We're at the International AIDS Conference in Melbourne, and it is July 2014. Thank you for joining me. It's a pleasure. Yeah, you have some exciting presentations that you've been giving coming out of the focus groups that you did with women, um, talking about their perceptions as it relates to PrEP to, and HIV acquisition. What are the things that you've learned? So the, the work that I've been doing with AIDS United, which is a national HIV and AIDS advocacy organization, was really looking at U.S. women in particular because they uh -huh. have not been included in the clinical trials looking mm -hmm. at the efficacy of PrEP for a whole host of scientific issues around numbers. But um, because the FDA was initially poised to approve pre-exposure prophylaxis for both women and men and then did it, mm -hmm. we did a set of focus groups both before and after the mm -hmm. approval, and what we were trying to find out is in the first case, did women even know about PrEP? And we were most interested, and, and then what did they think about it, right. might they use it, under what conditions, and so on, and a whole series of, of interests. But in the first case, the question is which women, because the FDA approval defined people for whom PrEP was appropriate as those at high risk. So what does that even mean? What's high risk? Right. And do, wi do women in our case think of themselves in that frame? And if they do, based on what? Mm -hmm. And then how do they translate that into whether they might use this kind of a prevention strategy or not? So part of what we learned is in the first case, e before and after approval of PrEP, so we had one set of focus groups before and one set after in different cities around the U.S. Mm -hmm. working with community-based organizations. So they were women serving organizations that recruited and led the sessions and all of mm -hmm. that. Um, what we've... And we had defined the women of interest to us in the focus groups as being in some senses at risk, but as much by their environment, which is how I, as a social scientist, begin right. to think about risk. Okay. Risk resides to a great extent in the environment. And that can mean everything from the level of HIV infection or prevalence in a community, mm -hmm. so that every sexual encounter or drug use encounter you have might infer greater risk just because there's more HIV in the community yep. than somewhere else, to an individual's own behaviors and practices, partnerships and things like that. So risk has got a lot of different levels, but I start by saying there's a lot in the environment itself mm -hmm. that begins the whole um, process. So we were in, so we had defined women at, at risk of HIV infection in those terms. Yep. So it was as much about well, they're in high prevalence communities. They're particularly black women and to a lesser extent Latino women who we recruited, and numbers proportionate to their experience in the U.S. epidemic. Um, and because they were, they had some relationship to or outreach with women serving organizations around STI, sexually transmitted infections, right. reproductive health, HIV prevention. They're already considering themselves at risk of something or another. Mm -hmm. So um, so we talked to the women and just said, "What do you, here's this thing, pre-exposure prophylaxis, described it to them, mm -hmm. and then said, in the first case, how many of you have ever even heard of this before we had this discussion? And out of the, we had 92 in the first set of focus groups and 144 in the second group, and I'd say overall, altogether, fewer than 20 women had ever even heard of it. Wow. So um, that was the first thing. They hadn't heard about it. In the second set of focus groups that happened after the FDA approval, almost a year after the approval, they were mad they hadn't heard about it. Mm -hmm. And most of them were black. 91% of the women were black women. They were mad they hadn't heard about it, and a number of women felt like there was a, a sort of reason they hadn't heard about it that had to do with the general public or medical establishment not caring about black people. Yeah. So they had a very complex way of understanding both their right. own risk and how PrEP uh, was or wasn't going to be something they'd hear about, which they ever use. Um, and they, in the course of talking about even no, knowledge of PrEP, they introduced notions of risk themselves, saying that, you know, we know that we have greater proportions of our people uh, represented in the epidemic, higher rates of infection among black people than white mm -hmm. people, particularly women in the United States. And so this is something we really should be hearing about. Mm -hmm. So they, they understood that there was some risk just in their community that they could internalize a little bit to themselves, whatever particular behaviors they themselves engaged in. Mm -hmm. What have you learned from that and then also as you've gone around to present that can inform how we could talk about this quote-unquote high-risk women in a way in which it's more engaging. Yeah, well, in the first case, I really try hard to never say high-risk women. In fact, I cringe when I hear those words, um, or men, mm -hmm. because it's not the people who are walking around, you know, doling out risk to right. other people or causing risk to other people. They are at risk of or vulnerable to various things like mm. HIV infection. And so at the very least, we can start and be really careful to say 
women at risk of HIV infection rather than risky women or women who are, you know, high risk. Um, And even that, you know, it's always complicated trying to balance between being vulnerable and being at risk, but also still exercising some agency to be able to control your life and, you know, prevent disease or to act in your own interest to get information. So I think we've learned that those things have to be in our heads at the same time. Mm -hmm. And in the HIV field, what's been tricky is, on the one hand, you don't want to call people, identify them too much as at risk, because by doing that, you're separating people from others, and you're stigmatizing in some way. Yep. Even if you don't call them risky people, you're saying you're most at risk, so you're like a problematic population, or one that's worrisome in some way. Um, so on the one hand, we don't want to stigmatize people, but on the other hand, we want to focus resources and target them and target programs to right. those who need them the most. So how you balance recognizing that not everybody is equally at risk of HIV infection at the same time as not stigmatizing them, I think is still the biggest challenge it's a journey, in the field. So. And you can see everybody in the field, scientists, practitioners, still struggling with that language. Agreed. Yeah. One more thing before we go, I want to ask you what you think it's going to take to end HIV transmission. Oh, I think fundamentally, as I have always thought fundamentally, in the end, what it takes is political and social will. So yeah. you can have every effective intervention under the stars. Which we have so many. you can have people educated about them, have access to uh-huh. them, have them paid for. Um, but if they're, well, if you don't have access, if there isn't the political will to make them available, to educate people appropriately, to make sure they're paid for, um, and in a non-stigmatizing way, yeah. in an equitable way, then we'll ne- we're never going to get to zero if we ever could get to zero. So I think all the targets and all the slogans that we hear at these conferences, you know, we've heard zero, 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 and 90, 90, 90, yep. and it used to be 3 by 5 and 20 by 20 and 20, 31, and yep. just all these sort of slogans. They're important heuristic devices. They're great aspirational goals. But in the end, for me, it's not about you and me picking up some tool and using it one by one, one woman at a time, as much as it is ensuring that politicians and governments and funders make it possible and safe for any of us to do what we need to do. I love it. And that's the only way we're ever going to get to zero, is really strong political will, commitment, financial support. I love and it. equity. I love it. <laughs> Judy for president. Spoken like a true <laughs> feminist sociology I love it. that I am. Thank you for all you do. I really also want to thank you for continuing to bring women into the conversation. You um, are so influential and speak on many different topics, but I've seen you now um, very artfully bring women in a way that I think is really valuable. Thank it keeps you us so from much. being left behind. So thank Appreciate you. That. Yeah. Thanks very much.